Hi, I'm Jonah Comstock, Editor-in-Chief of PharmaForm. I'm here at ASCO 23. It's Sunday morning. I'm joined by Arun Krishna uh, from AstraZeneca. What's your title there? So I'm the head of uh, lung cancer commercial at okay. AstraZeneca. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Adora trial, um, which which was, was focused on a, a lung cancer treatment that's already in the market. That's correct. Uh, but uh, so far has only proven uh, what the previous data dealt with disease-free survival, and the That's new right. data deals with overall survival. That's correct. So, so give us the overview of, of yeah. both kind of what the data showed and, and why this is a, a really important distinction. No, absolutely. Yeah, Jonas, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at ASCO in 23. It's great to see uh, you know, friends and, and, and colleagues here. So let, let me take a step back and rewind a little bit before I answer your question specifically. So at AstraZeneca, one of the things, our bold ambition is to eliminate cancer as a cause of death. Now, when you put that into perspective, what it really means is that how do we have patients who are diagnosed earlier, who get treated earlier, and have a bigger chance of surviving longer, right? And what we realize over a period of time is that by having treatment interventions that move earlier in the setting, we are able to show a significant benefit in terms of disease-free survival, which we showed with Adora, and then potentially overall survival. Now, the concept here with Adora specifically is for EGFR patients who have been diagnosed in the early stage setting, right? They then undergo surgery, and then they look to see whether ozimertinib is an option for them uh, as a maintenance setting. And I'm really pleased that what we will share later today in the plenary session and what you probably have seen already in the press release is that we have shown that Adora in that early stage setting post-surgery for EGFR patients have a significant overall survival benefit. And what does that mean specifically is we are able to show 51% reduction in the risk of death. And in five years, what we see from the data is nine out of 10 patients are still alive when you compare it to a placebo arm, where only 78% of those patients are still alive at five years. So this is a huge impact for patients because now there is the first and only treatment within the EGFR setting in that early stage showing overall survival. So one thing that I've kind of been wondering, and I hope this isn't too sort of like uh, elementary a question, yeah. but shouldn't disease-free survival imply better overall survival it because it seems like this was really not a done deal or a sure thing and and I, I think dr herbst mentioned in the in the press briefing that some you know not, not insignificant number of providers were hesitant to prescribe this without this overall survival data. that is so, right so very very good question and i think this comes back to the trials in the past so there have been previous trials with other tkis in this early stage setting where Unfortunately, they have shown a benefit with disease-free survival, but not with overall survival. And, and the rationale sometimes for that is really, you know, in a disease-free survival, when patients stop treatment, do they recur really quickly? And mm. if they do recur really quickly, does that then impact overall survival data? And what we then are able to build that confidence now in the setting is great disease-free survival that we have seen, and now also overall survival, which now shows give them the confidence to treat. Okay, so what you're really saying is like that the cancer is, is gone and it's not coming back, right? Or right. In, not in all cases, but not in more in all cases. cases. In more cases. Yeah. And, and that's where is there a, you know, a discussion that we need to have in terms of what does cure look like? Okay. Right. It's an ongoing discussion right in the history of oncology. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's a, it's a moving goalpost, but in, hopefully in a good way, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so there, there, was, there has been kind of a trend. Um, at this ASCO mm -hmm. about thinking about these cancer drugs in, in terms of not just like additively, yeah. but like how can we start to replace some of the really toxic and, and, and difficult therapies like surgery and radiation mm -hmm. with these drugs. And, and this isn't exactly in that vein, but yeah. it feels like there's, there's a, I mean, is there a connection there? Yeah. So it, Yes, and a little bit no. Care for patients moving forward is going to be very personalized. And I think that's a great thing. I mean, if you rewind 10 years ago, everything was chemo. Even in the lung cancer space, for example, right? Chemo was the best option of choice. Now with targeted interventions like ozimertinib and Tegriso and other interventions, we're able to really target the cancer in a very specific way. 
And then you have IO treatments, which are also now available, which kind of activates and, and modulates the immune, uh, it, you know, um, data there to be able to drive some 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 benefit as well. So so there is a concept of how do we now have the right regimen for the right patient, and how in, and the importance of biomarker testing becomes super mm, critical. Yeah, because if you're not tested, then you don't know what's the right treatment to provide. One point worth mentioning is is that uh, the effects that you saw in this trial were across patient groups. Basically, right. like any way you could segment the patients, yeah. this held true, right? Correct. So, so uh, again, the the, the treat uh, the the population was what we were looking at in the trial was one B to three A, right? And what we saw both from a DFS standpoint, but also overall, was very consistent across the board. So whether you're a 1B patient who's gone through surgery or you're a little bit of a sicker patient in a 3A subgroup, you've seen that benefit consistently across those groups. We also have a forest plot that you will see as part of the data, which looks at all the different other categories like race and gender and Smoker, non smokers, non-smokers, and you see a very consistent uh, positive impact of that data. So one question that I'm trying to ask everyone that I talk yeah. to at ESCO, um, it's going to be in our in our deep dive issue, is is about um, the way the technology is changing that, that you guys mm -hmm. use to do your work, um, especially around digital and yeah. AI. Yeah. Uh, how has that kind of started to change how you do oncology work at AstraZeneca, oh, wow. and and how do you think it's going to in the next five to ten years? I think the digital revolution in the medical space is here to stay, right? Um, there are a couple of things that I think becomes really critical for us to be able to move at pace. One is data, right? Internally within AstraZeneca or externally within hospital systems and health systems, how data is captured and is there connectivity in the data space, right? Once I believe that in the health system side of things, once data is being, you're able to connect data and follow the patients longitudinally through their journey, you're able to then make a better informed decision through machine learning or AI and all of that. So I believe, I believe that first the fundamentals we need to get right, which is about data. And once we have data, I think machine learning and artificial intelligence can be really applied to better understand and predict which patient may be responding to a treatment, which patient may be not responding. How do we get early markers in that space? The other bit, which I think is critically important and more specifically in the lung space is, it's great that we now have treatments in the early setting, but it's critically important that patients get diagnosed earlier, right? And when you look at US screening rates nationally, it's less than 5%. So how can we use data and artificial intelligence and other things to get patients screened earlier and detected earlier so they can benefit from treatments like check this out. Yeah, I like you brought it full circle with your last answer about yeah. this personalization. This is going to be a piece of it, screening, biomarkers, and, and just this array of options when it comes to treatment. Correct, and absolutely, because at every intervention or episode of care, if you put it like that, of the patient journey, you need now, you will have data and maybe advanced analytics to inform better treatment, not just treatment options, but better care for those patients. Anything else you've noticed at the show so far that's been interesting to you? Any trends you're tracking? Or, yeah, you know, I think, you know, I, I think it's the, the pace at which oncology is moving today is unprecedented, right? And uh, and to your point, with data and all of the other things, we're able to really drive change quickly. So I am really keen about how things are moving in the early stage across all the different treatment options. Is it either it's IO or it's targeted and how that looks like. I think that's exciting. The other bit also, I think we are very passionate about in AstraZeneca is about the concept of health equity, right? And how do we drive that across community setting, whether it's a screening or whether it's early detection. How do people get a chance to make sure that they have and deserve the right infrastructure, the environment, the health system to be able to give them the best uh, opportunity to have a meaningful life? Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. This has been a great conversation. Absolutely. And enjoy so the rest of the show. Yeah, you too. Thank you.